I grew up in a conservative Jewish home. I set the record for most absences from the Reform Hebrew School. I never heard of the mitzvahs. Never heard of them. My whole appreciation of Jerusalem at that point was going to the Wailing Wall. Then I felt the tap on the shoulder. I turn around and says, uh, are you Jewish? And he said, would you like to see what yeshiva is like? Three and a half thousand years ago, when Hashem told us to build him a mikdash, he did not say, build me a sanctuary so I can live in the building. God doesn't need a physical structure to live in. He's God. What Hashem wanted was for us to make a space in our hearts and minds and invite him into our lives so that we can have godliness shine through us. What stood over here so long ago was only a testimony to that deep connection that existed between us and Hashem. As soon as that inner space was contaminated by hatred, jealousy, indifference, and apathy towards one another, the Beis HaMikdash was destroyed. This Tisha B'Av, as we reflect and contemplate Golas and Geula, what we have to think about is how to rebuild this structure. And that involves loving one another helping each other reconnect with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And there is no greater example than Rav Meir Shuster. Rav Meir stood right here at the Mokam HaMikdash for almost his entire adult life, looking out for people, for wandering the Shamas, and try to bring them closer to Hashem. That was the epitome of Avas Yisrael, caring about another Jew. When we talk about Rav Meir Shuster and we try to describe who he was, it becomes glaringly obvious that it makes no sense how this person single-handedly inspired an entire generation to tshuva. Rav Meir grew up in Wisconsin in the 1950s. He attended public school until he was 11 years old, after which his parents sent him to the local Jewish day school that was run at the time by Rabbi Dr. Abraham J. Tversky. Rabbi Tversky sent him to yeshiva two years later, and Rav Meir went to Neri Yisrael in 1960. If you were to walk into yeshiva Neri Yisrael in 1960, and you were to look around the Bismedrish, and you had to guess who is going to end up impacting an entire generation of Bali Tshuva, your last guess would be the shy, soft-spoken, quiet, reserved kid sitting and learning in the back of the Beis HaMedrash. How did this man, who didn't have the personality or the background, inspire and change so many thousands of people to tshuva? Uh, I met Rabbi Meir C. Schuster uh, in 1966. I went to Nair Yisrael from 1964 to 1968. Meir is one who, can, who encouraged me to come to Nair Yisrael in Baltimore, and he was my vecker in the morning about 
7 o'clock, he would be going from room to room in his robe, and it was like, come on, Shlaimi, get up, get up, get up, Shlaimi, get up. And he was, he was, I tell you, he was an Ovid Hashem. It was like, that's what, who, that's, that was his mahus. He had a special neshama, that's for sure. I mean, uh, I mean, his neshama was the, whoever who needed help, he, he helped. Uh, and he did it in a very idle way, a very gentle way. He couldn't talk. He was shy. Mayor Schuster is going to go up to complete strangers and, and, and then talk them into going to yeshiva or spending. I would say it's impossible. He, had, he, he was so uh, naturally uh, an introvert. When you saw him daven, you wanted to be a part of that. The way he looked up, uh, he was speaking to Hashem. And uh, maybe I have some misgivings. Uh, if I could have maybe listened in a little bit, maybe I could have asked the mayor, what were you asking Kodesh Baruch Hu for? Um, I think I probably would have heard that uh, Hashem is my best friend and uh, I'm, I'm getting reacquainted. I'm, I'm sharing my life with him. He's sharing, he's sharing his essence with me. And when you saw him daven, you wanted to be a part of that. And I felt, you know, I was touched by just watching him daven. I became a different person because I saw Rev. Mayor Daven. I once heard a great story about the Rosh Hashiva of Panovich, Rav Shach. When the Mashgiach of Chatzko Levenstein passed away, Rav Shach gave an eulogy and he said that he had never seen an Ovid Hashem, someone who serves Hashem, like Rav Chatzko. After the funeral, one of Rav Shach's Talmidim came over and asked him, how could you say such a thing about Rav Chatzko? The Rosh Hashiva saw the Chafetz Chaim, the Gadol Hadar. Rav Shach told him, he said, every person has a Mila, and in that Mila he can be the Gadol Hadar. Rav Chatzko was the Gadol Hadar in going against his nature. In our generation, the giant in going against his nature was Rav Meir. Rav Meir was not a natural conversationalist. He didn't like to talk. He only spoke if he absolutely had to. So when he would be at the Kaisal and approach people, you can actually reduce his entire conversation to just two questions. Are you Jewish? And if the answer was yes, he would follow it up with, would you like to hear a class in Jewish philosophy? That was it. And you sort of wonder to yourself, like, how could somebody convince someone else to take a class, bring him to yeshiva, go to Eish, or Sameach, Nevei, with two questions? We moved into the Jewish quarter of the old city of Jerusalem. I went down and went looking for a man who I only knew by description. And there I saw this tall, lanky man wearing a black suit and a black hat, and bearded. And I walked over to him and introduced myself. And I said, Hi, I'm Michael Kaufman. I just moved into that apartment. I pointed to our apartment overlooking the uh, western wall. And I said, I'm at your service. In the middle of our discussion, as I stood there, he did a complete about face and made a beeline away from me and towards the western wall. And there I saw a young man about his early 20s with a backpack on, and he had his head on his arm, which was at the Kotel, at the western wall. And he tapped him on the back. And I watched as he engaged him in conversation about a minute or two later, he headed towards me, and without even slowing down, he said, I'm, take, I'm going to Eish Torah. I'll see you later. That was my introduction to Rav Meir Shusta. Can you imagine a person like this, who is as shy as can possibly be, going up to a with it young college man or woman, and getting that person 
persuading that person to change his direction of life and becoming a religious Jew. Anybody who you would speak to would, would give you the same profile. <laughs> that he was not cut out for this job. Uh, it's not something that he would, that you would ever uh, hire him to do, but, but he was somebody that cared. It didn't come easy to him to have a conversation. It was very to the point questions and there was no flourish. There was no side conversation. He just wanted to get the job done. There was no ego. There was no shield between him and the people. It was just him saying, this is what I want you to do. This is what you need to do. Uh, it just attracted me because it was so truthful. It was so, uh, uh, so real. One person told me, so he went back to LA. Uh, he wasn't from. He got a knock on his door at 11 o'clock at night. It was Reb Mayer. Reb Mayer searched, tracked down his address, um, went to this unknown place, knocked on the door and said, how are you doing? That's all he said to him. I just came to find out how you're doing. And the person was so astonished by that act of care and concern that that reconnected him with his Judaism and, uh, and he found his way back. Remer wasn't doing it as a technique. Remer, it was, he, he would genuinely remember this person and, and wanted to know how he was doing. The greatness of Remeo was that he made himself into a great person. My family and I were truly blessed at the schuss of becoming closer to Remeo's sister as having stayed here with us for approximately one week every year for almost 20 years. I was walking with him to shul one Shabbos morning and I said to him, I said, I don't even know what we're supposed to do. I don't even know what we're doing here. And he stopped and he never stops. And he turned to me and he looked me in the eyes and he put his finger on my chest and he said, do you want to know what we're doing here? I didn't answer him. He said, do you want to know what we're doing here? And I said, yes. He said, our job is to bring light to the world and God forbid darkness. That is what we're doing here. And he turned and he continued walking. And I said to myself for the first time I understood who he was. He was on a mission. He was driven. He was driven to relight the flame of every neshama that was in jeopardy or possibly could be lost. He was going to spread as much Torah and light to the world as possible. And he thought and he knew that this was his mission and he certainly believed it was ours as well. You know what's really interesting? What inspired Rev Mayer to come out here every single day for 40 years is a story that you and I heard tens of times. The famous story with the Nitziv. When the Nitziv made his siyam on Hamik Shaila and Sheiltis, he made a party for his family and friends and told them how when he was a kid, he was struggling with his learning and his parents were about to send him to learn how to become a shoemaker. But he begged them and he cried and he asked them for another chance. And then Tzif said, imagine, had I become a shoemaker, I would have come up after 120 to Shemayim. And they would have asked me, did you learn Torah? Check. Did you daven? Check. Did you do mitzvahs? Check. Did you make chesed? Check. Where are your sfarim? He said, I don't know about any sfarim. I got shoes. The tziv said, now, when I come up to Shemaim, I can be proud that I fulfilled my potential. I'll show them the hammock shayla and the hammock dove. Rav Meir, when he heard the story, he felt like he has to discover what is it that I have to do with my life? How can I do it? So he and his friend, Rabbi Chaim Sofer, they came to the coastal here. And he wanted a daven to ask Hashem to open his eyes. And I saw a guy in a backpack, you know, uh, he looked Jewish. And I said to him, like, you know, well, uh, let's, let's go over to this guy, you know, maybe, you know, a lot of guys over here like this, you know, I've been here in La Coise a lot of times, and uh, maybe, maybe we should do something about it, you know, let's, let's talk to him a little bit. And we gave him a, a couple of shivas and a suggestion. And uh, he said, that would be very, very nice. Next two, three times, we did the same thing. I started up, you wanna, you know, 
you want to know a little bit more about, uh, you know, Judaism, stuff like that. Then about uh, the fourth or fifth time, he told me, you know, like, you know, let me try it myself. I want to try, you know. Go ahead, Mayor, I had no problem, you know. So he started up and he, he goes over to the guy and like, um, do you like it around here? You know, and it was very fuzzy, I don't know how you say it, but it worked. And he got him too. And that's, from what I hear, that's the beginning of the, <laughs> of the whole story. Uh, he just kept on going and going and going for the next 40 years. The time was ripe. This was in 1970, after the Yom Kippur War, in Moscow, Ilyasis was beginning his care. There was a worldwide uh, revolution. Uh, my parents didn't have much of a background, my father even less. And that kind of uh, was typical for, I think, uh, Americans back then. Uh, and that continued until my bar mitzvah. Bar mitzvah was a very big event. My Jewish education ended promptly thereafter, and I never put two together at that point that, you know, the bar mitzvah should be the beginning of doing mitzvahs, not the end of doing mitzvahs. My parents didn't have a problem with me dropping it, and I applied to a couple of universities. I applied to the Naval Academy. I got an appointment to the Naval Academy as well, uh, and I was in an ROTC program. So that meant that they paid my way, and after four years in university, I was expected to graduate as a commissioned officer and join the Navy. So I went to Israel and to work on a kibbutz and I was scheduled to be there for four weeks. And uh, working in the morning, learning Hebrew in the afternoon, and basically having a great time meeting people from all over the world. During my stay on, on the kibbutz, you were allowed to get one day off and to go wherever you'd like to. And I think my, my whole appreciation of Jerusalem at that point was going to the Wailing Wall. I went to the Kotel on an Arab Shabbos, uh, and I was one of the observing Jews, trying to get, take it all in and staring at this wall that had been standing for thousands of years, and, uh, and I got tapped on the shoulder by an individual I didn't know. And I turned around, and he asked me, you know, uh, are you Jewish? And I said, yes. And he says, would you like to go attend a class in Jewish philosophy? And I was an open-minded person. I said, why not? I didn't have any other great agenda for that day. And he said, great. And he says, come with me. And that was really the extent of the entire conversation. I don't know if he asked me any additional questions, uh, but before I knew it, I was uh, in front of Rabbi Noah Weinberg, Zetzal, uh, in one of his famous 48 Ways to Wisdom classes. And uh, I was all prepared to go on my way, but before I could leave the classroom, there was Rabbi Schuster. And he said, would you like to speak to the rabbi who just gave the class? And I said, I don't think so. And he said, come with me. They hustled me right in to see Rabbi Weinberg. And he says, did you like what you hear? Yes, would you like to stay longer? And I said, I really can't because I have a commitment to go back to the kibbutz. And I said, well, what about after the kibbutz? And I said, I think I would like that. I had a commitment to the Navy. And if you don't show up, you can go AWOL. And the Navy is very strict about those kind of things. There was a time when the pressure was so great, um, I was considering leaving, and I had a conversation in the dining room with, with Rabbi Schuster. And I told him, I said, Rabbi Schuster, it's not right. I have a commitment to the Navy, to my country, and I have to go back. And he asked me, I says, well, you know a little bit about Judaism now. He says, when did the Jewish people stand at Mount Sinai? I said, over 3,300 years ago, thereabouts. So he said, your commitment to our Sinai precedes your commitment to the U.S. Navy. <laughs> you make the choice. Rabbi Schuster was part of uh, uh, me uh, staying in yeshiva for the first time. He was part of my life in making sure I was taken care of when I was in college. Uh, it was through the family he set me up with that I eventually uh, made a shidduch uh, with. And uh, it was just, as I said, a continuum that lasted me through life and uh, very much appreciative of everything he did. 
and how much he cared. Her sister didn't see a people, he saw neshamas. It didn't matter what color the hair was, it didn't matter how many earrings they had, it didn't matter what they looked like. He wanted them to give them opportunity to grow. He didn't see where they were coming from, he looked where they could go. And that's, that's who he was. When we started filming for the documentary, I had no idea how much of an impact Rav Meir Schuster had on the world, on the Jewish world. When I started reviewing the filming and the footage and the interviews, I saw that my kid's principal, Rabbi Shlomo Goldberg, was one of the people that was tapped on the shoulder by Rav Meir. And that blew me away because that means I was indirectly affected by Rav Meir Schuster. I grew up in, born in the Bronx, moved to New Rochelle, New York when I was a baby. Lived there until I was about 11 or 12 years old when my family moved to El Paso, Texas. And I got bar mitzvahed, you know, in the, in the Reformed Temple. We had to ask to, to be allowed to wear a yarmulke. My parents wanted me to wear a yarmulke when I was bar mitzvahed, but in the Reformed Temple you weren't allowed. I lived there until I went off to college uh, in those years. Went to a small college in north central Texas, just north of Dallas, between Dallas and the Oklahoma border, called Austin College. It's that I was a political science major. It was before school when I went to the head of the department to uh, get my schedule uh, signed off on for the classes that I would be taking. Another gentleman came in. His name was Dr. Larry Fuchsia. The head of the department introduced him to me and said he's joining the staff and he's going to be teaching a course in fascism, the Nazi experience in World War II. So that sounded very interesting to me. I was fascinated by the topic and that it was such a thing would be taught. So I changed my schedule in order to be able to take that course. And then that year, in the month of January, the professors could teach any course that they wanted to, and it was for a month. And his course was a trip to Israel. So when I heard about that opportunity, I grabbed it. There were a group of, I don't know, 14 or 15 of us. There was one other Jewish person in the group, a young man named Bennett, I don't remember his last name. And Larry took us on this trip to Israel. We arrived in Israel. We were actually staying in hotels in the Arab section of the old city because they were less expensive. And I remember that when I saw the hotel, there's no reason why I should have any connection to it. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it represented. Uh, but when I saw it and I was there, I was really overcome with emotion. And I was approached by a tall man who asked me the question, uh, are you Jewish? And would you be interested in spending Shabbos, or having a Shabbos meal with a religious family, with an Orthodox family, and is there anyone else who's Jewish in your group? So I answered, are there other Jews? Yes, Bennett. Uh, would we be interested in spending Shabbos with an Orthodox family? I think so. And we took off, uh, trying as hard as we could to keep up with him, because that man, of course, was uh, Rabbi Meir Schuster, and he was a very fast walker. So we trailed behind him as he took us out of the old city uh, into Meir Sharim. That Shabbos was very special. I still have it, uh, I still have it etched in my mind. There were, um, there was a purity in the house which was extremely simple. Uh, Rabbi Schuster took us to Or Sameach, uh, to learn with someone, you know, who was there. And that was the first Shabbos experience. I decided to wear a yarmulke, you know, when I was on the, the trip because I felt very special being Jewish. But there was something that was awakened within me uh, in terms of a desire to be Jewish. And that stuck with me uh, even when I returned. I had thought about coming back, like I said when I had left, that I would be back. I didn't know when, I didn't know how, uh, but I appreciated the fact that Rabbi Shusha wanted me to come back and that he would work things out if I ever did. Uh, when I got there, and it was again a Friday night, so there I was at the wall, and a tall gentleman tapped me on the shoulder. I turned around and he said to me, Steve from Texas, right? And that was amazing that he remembered me. He said, is Bennett with you? 
I said, no, Bennett's not, Bennett's not with me. I'm in a different group. I'm on an Opan. He says, you decided to go to an Opan on a kibbutz. I wish you'd have come to Yeshiva. So I said, well, this is what I started and what I decided for now. And he said, are you interested in spending Shabbos with the family? I said, well, that's actually one of the reasons that I came down to the wall. I'm happy you found me. And I set back out following Rabbi Schuster to the same family, to the fine handlers, who accepted me back like I was a long lost cousin. So I made the decision that, even though I hadn't been in touch with Rabbi Schuster for many years, that I was going to go down and I was going to give Yeshiva a real try. I walked into the Yeshiva offices, and of course, who was there in the office when I came to enroll in the Yeshiva? Uh, the person who was there was Rabbi Schuster. So he took a look at me. I said, I held out my hands. I said, Rev. Mayor, put on the cuffs, take me away. I'm, I'm turning myself in. So he was very happy. He gave me a big hug. He worked out the enrollment. I became part of Yeshiva Torah and I guess the rest is history. Many years ago, I was standing with Rabbi Meir's sister at the Kotel, and I was having a conversation, and talking to Rabbi Meir's sister at the Kotel, you're probably mostly talking to yourself, because 90% of his focus was looking over my shoulder to see if there were any potential targets approaching. And sure enough, while I was standing there, I remember this tall, skinny kid with a backpack with a long ponytail walking by, and Rabbi Meir Shuster hooked his arm into him. And he goes, what are you doing, man? He says, what's wrong with you? He says, are you Jewish? He says, you don't have to be Jewish to be at the ball. He says, you don't even know if you're Jewish? He says, I happen to be Jewish. He goes, how do you know you're Jewish? He says, because my parents are Jewish. He said, really? He turns with him and he says, tell me about your parents. And he starts walking off. He says, I was walking with him. I was talking to him. And I said, by the way, where are you staying? He says, I'm staying in the Christian quarter. He says, you can't stay in the Christian quarter. You're Jewish, you gotta stay in the Jewish quarter. So he says, I'm perfectly comfortable there. I don't wanna move, I'm happy there. He says, and I spoke to him and I talked to him and there was nothing I could do. He said, so yesterday morning, I was on my way to Minyan, probably in eights in the morning. He says, I realized that was 20 minutes early. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna go by where the hostel where this kid is staying and I'm gonna lean against the wall and say something to Hillam. He says, can you believe it? Five minutes later, he walks out. And I grab him by the arm and I said, you need to stay in the Jewish quarter. You're Jewish, you don't understand it. He goes, Rabbi, are you crazy? Have you been waiting here all night? What's wrong with you? And he said, okay, take me where you want me to stay tonight. I'm happy to stay in the Jewish quarter. He says, and Baruch Hashem, he's staying at the Heritage House and I have him booked at his first class at Asia Torah tomorrow morning. I said, the reason that happened is because he cared. He really cared. And I think God didn't want to disappoint Reb Meir's sister, I really do. I grew up in a little town called Willimantic, Connecticut, which has about 15,000 people, about 100 Jewish families in the whole area. Um, when I graduated college, uh, I was watching TV and um, John Chancellor came on the TV, who was the Channel 4, NBC. At the end of the report about the Yom Kippur War in Israel, um, he said, and Israel needs 10,000 volunteers to work on kibbutz to replace the soldiers who were uh, on the front. That was the first time I ever thought about going to Israel. I said, well, I wanted to go someplace warm. I wanted to go someplace far away. And Israel fit the bill. I was there for about a year. And I had decided that I was going to go back to America and go into the Peace Corps. I had been accepted into the Peace Corps to go to Senegal. This was about February. In November, I was supposed to go into to Senegal. Um, and uh, I was leaving Israel. I was going, I was with a friend of mine who uh, also ultimately became religious. Um, and he had a car, so we drove to the Kotel. We parked the car about two o'clock in the afternoon. We walked around Jerusalem. We ended up at the Kotel. I wanted to say goodbye to the Kotel. Um, and it was about 8 o'clock at night, and we decided it was time to get out of here. We're going to Tel Aviv. And uh, I walked into the parking lot, and there was a guy there standing there with a snap brim hat, uh, a suit and a tie. He looked at me, and he said, how would you like to meet a rabbi? And I said, uh, how old is he? He said, 50. I said, too old. Not interested. Right? And then he looked at me and said, how can you not be open to your religion? 
It was in 1977, and my whole purpose in life at that time was to be open to experience. So that kind of like got me. Um, and uh, my friend, who was actually a Greek, uh, wanted to go see this rabbi, and we argued a little bit. So we said, okay, we'll go meet the rabbi. We went to this class that Rabbi Schiller, Schiller taught. You know, rabbi Schiller was probably, he was, his class was the most impressive thing I had ever seen. He was like the smartest guy I'd ever met. He talked about Plato and Aristotle and the relationship between oral law and the written law. I didn't even know there was an oral law. And when we got up and out of there, um, Rev. Mir was waiting for us. Yeah. And he said, Rabbi Schiller would like to talk to you. So anyway, we went down to the office, and Rabbi Mir stands outside the office waiting for us. And Rabbi Schiller said, after a long, long conversation, Rabbi said, well, boys, we stay here for a week. And I said, Rabbi Schiller, you know, I said, I think you took very good things for the Jewish people here, for the Jewish young men. But, you know, um, I'm going to Tel Aviv, then I'm going to the beach, then I'm going to the, the, um, the airport, and then I'm going to the Peace Corps. And besides, they have this ticket that uh, says if I, that if I lose my ticket in a week, I'm gonna lose my, um, I lose the, lose the ticket. And he said, if your ticket is your problem, you don't have a problem. He said, I thought about why I wasn't gonna go back there. And instead, I, I, enjoy, I enjoyed uh, talking about Jewish philosophy. I wanted, I, he offered me to live in Jerusalem for three months and go to classes from nine to, nine to one in the, in the morning. And I thought, why am I not gonna be there? I'm not gonna be there because um, I'm afraid they're gonna brainwash me. And then I thought to myself, since I was 27 years old, if they can brainwash me in three months, they can have my brain. <laughs> and I decided to go back for, th for three months. And, you know, I have tremendous hakar satov because uh, my entire life and lifestyle is a result of uh, this guy who I would probably never have been friends with, who would never have hung out with in high school who was there every day, was simply um, the most persistent guy that you could imagine. Mrs. Schuster, um, in fact, when my first child was born, Mrs. Schuster made a, um, knitted a sweater for him, which we still have, um, which all of my kids wore, um, and which is a uh, prized possession. I mean, now I'm thinking about it, but that we haven't brought it out, but now that I have grandchildren, it occurs to me now that we're gonna use it, use it for the grandchildren. I think that, you know, there's thousands of people like that who are out there who did more Judaism-wise because they met him and they ended up studying a little bit, um, and I think that was his purpose. I keep on, to this day, bumping into people, and I, I'm always fascinated whenever I hear that somebody's a Baal Shiva. I always ask them for their story, um, and the amount of people who tell me to this day, new people that, I, that I'm meeting for the first time, that their experience began with Reb Meir and picking them up uh, continues to astonish. I was born in a uh, completely non-religious, um, secular Jewish family. Religious Judaism was something I just never heard of, never knew of. I always felt strongly Jewish um, my whole life. When Yom Kippur came, <clears throat> I was one of the few people in my extended family uh, that would fast. And then on Yom Kippur afternoon, I remember at four in the afternoon, we would drive to my aunt's house to break the fast. I remember my, my mother's sister, my aunt, you know, saying, why don't you eat something? And I said, well, no, I'm waiting until a sundown. She says, no, no, it's okay. You prove the point, you can eat now. In 1983, when my medical school class was graduating, a friend of mine, his name is Steve, we decided to take a trip around the world together, sort of a graduation trip. We were in Amsterdam, we were in uh, uh, Luxembourg. I guess the major concentration of time was gonna be in Israel. So we went to Israel, we were backpacking, it was on uh, Pesach, and we had our backpacks on, no yarmulkes, and this guy comes up to us who, who from our perspective looked like he was from Mars. It looked like, you know, like something we did never, like uh, something we added it from out of this world. He had a, he had a black hat, a long beard, um, some payas going behind the ears, if I remember correctly, long, you know, black jacket. And he came up to us and he said, are you boys Jewish? And we said, yeah, yeah, we were Jewish. And he introduced his name, his name is Rabbi Mayor Schuster. He said, what are you doing? For the last uh, tomorrow night, which is the uh, tomorrow night, which is the last night of Pesach, of Passover, 
So my friend Steve and I looked at each other and said, I don't know, maybe we'll go see a movie or something. You know, we didn't have any specific plans. So he said, well, how would you like to spend it with, a, with an Orthodox Jewish family? So I spoke to Steve about it. And we, and we said, you know what? For the cultural experience, like you might go spend time with an Indian family or a Chinese family, just to see culturally like what they do. Yeah, let's, you know, we're Jewish. Might as well see what an Orthodox Jewish family does. So we agreed and we stayed overnight to the next day because um, I just really enjoyed the conversations. It was um, the most intellectually honest and open conversation I'd ever had. There was, it was, it was, it was exuding integrity. I could challenge anything. I could ask anything. If I stumped him, he would say it. Uh, there was no need to show an ego, defend an ego, defend an idea because it was his. Um, and that, so that's what Rabbi Schuster had put us there um, by Rabbi, Rabbi uh, Kaznet. And then we ended up staying the whole next day and then the next night, which was the eighth day of Pesach. We left wearing yarmulkes and I made a commitment at that point based on the intellectual integrity that I'd seen in Rabbi Kesnet's home and the, the, really the Kedusha, not that I could have put a word to it at that point, that I would start keeping kosher from that point forward. Um, and that was our first exposure to Rabbi, Rabbi Schuster. I once asked Rabbi Schuster, how many people did you approach? How many people do you think you sent to the yeshivas? And he was very hesitant to answer me. And he said, I don't know. I said, you have to have some type of idea. I said, do you have a number? He says, more than 5,000. That's the first thing he ever said to me. And I'm sure it may, it may have been a lot more if you think about all the kids he sent to all the families, to all the homes, for all the circus meals, for all the people he grabbed and sent in and out of different yeshivas and how many that he had an effect on. One on one, I don't think anybody had a bigger effect. I grew up in uh, a, uh, a reform household in suburban Boston. My father was considered a very Jewish guy within the reform temple. He used to go every Friday night to services. He was participated in the, in the temple a lot, but Basically, none of us were turned on to Judaism at all. I grew up in public school system in Andover, and I went after that to Boston University. I majored in uh, journalism. One of my motivations for becoming a, a journalist was because I had felt that I hadn't really come in contact with anyone that really had the truth in the world. I had gotten to a point of uh, desperation I didn't find anybody out there who I felt knew what life was about. I uh, decided that I would um, come to uh, Israel to see what kibbutz was like. I was staying at a friend's house in Jerusalem, and it was the middle of the summer, and it was extraordinarily hot. And I couldn't get out of the house even to, to even walk around at all. And after a few days inside, I got cabin fever, and inside I have to uh, see, some, see some of the sites before I go to kibbutz. So the most important site, anybody, any Jew knows this, is the Western Wall. So I came to the Western Wall, and uh, someone tapped me on the shoulder when I was there. And I turned around, and Rabbi Mayor Schuster, I didn't know him by that name at that point, he said, are you Jewish? I said, yes, I am. And he said, would you like to see what yeshiva is like? My reaction subconsciously was twofold. Uh, first of all, this will make a great story as a journalist, <laughs> right? My experiences in yeshiva. And the other one was, um, I really want to go and show them where they've made their mistake. So I, uh, Rev Schuster, brought me to uh, speak to Rav Noach uh, Weinberg at Asia Tor, just up the stairs from the, from the Western Wall. I, was, I actually was extremely impressed with uh, the professionalism of the speakers there and the logic of their arguments. They were extremely persuasive in their argument. They weren't per uh, persuasive enough to prevent me from going to kibbutz. I went to the program anyway. After an extremely 
disappointing experience on kibbutz after I'm thinking five months or so. Um, I came. I came back to. Uh, I came back here to Asia Torah to learn. When I got to be 16, my brother went to Israel to be on kibbutz. He invited me to come Pesach time uh, when he was on kibbutz, and he had already become interested in in Yiddishkeit and Judaism. And uh, he took me to a Pesach seder, but didn't push too much on me, and took me to a. Uh, Pesach Seder here in the old city by Yaakov Kleiman, and uh, that was my only exposure to any religious Judaism ever, I think. And, and I came home and never really thought about it more, except for the fact that he became more and more religious and then started writing me letters. Two weeks into, my, into the next semester in Emerson College in Boston, after having received many letters from my brother, I... Uh, it got, I, I got the uh, feeling that my brother was probably onto something smart and I uh, came to Israel and uh, basically never looked back after that. I never went back to college and stayed in yeshiva and uh, yeah, I took discovery when I first got here and then just stayed in yeshiva till, till today. I've been here for over 30 years. I have a family that I brought up here in Yerushalayim myself, and I have uh, I have uh, seven children, and uh, at last count, the same number of grandchildren. My sisters, I have uh, three sisters, two of whom became observant in, in this indirect way through uh, Mayor Schuster, both of them coming after my brother and I had come here, both of them coming wanting to check out what authentic Torah Judaism was about. So how did Rav Meir manage to convince thousands and thousands of people to just follow him blindly to yeshiva's seminaries and classes with just a few words? You see, it's not about the words we say as much as who we are and how we come across to other people. Rav Meir was, in one word, real. He was authentic. He sincerely and really cared and loved every single Jew. And that came through in the few words that he spoke. Rabbi Schuster was uh, maybe the ultimate salesman, the ultimate um, man to go out and find the clients, find the customers, um, and just to get them just to take a little taste of Yiddishkeit. And I think he knew and trusted that once they got a taste of what was real, they would see a difference. If Reb Meir can, can make his contribution, you know, being basically meeting people, given his uh, personality, which was really very shy and, and introverted, right, then any of us can do something um, for Klai Yisrael that we don't think that we can do. I'll tell you what Rabbi Schiller once told me. Years ago, I was very close to Rabbi Schiller and from Or Sameach, the head of Or Sameach, and Rabbi Schiller told me at one point, he said that I would say that um, at least half the yeshiva came from Meir Shuster. And I heard the same thing from uh, Rabbi Refsin from the Vey Yerushalayim. He said at least half his yeshiva would be girls that he picked up. Uh, Meir he lost a child many years ago. He sent a shaila to Rebbe Yashiv, uh, who was the Paisik, the Goyen of Eretz Yisrael, and he sent a shaila to him, asked somebody to go ask a shaila if he has to sit shiva or not, because he says, it's Hatzolus Nefoshis, and every minute I'm away from the Kaisel or away from doing my work, I write his HaKodesh, so I, I, we're missing, we're losing people, losing kids. So I, I, I'm I'm a queef to sit shiva. Rav Yashav tasked him that he has to sit shiva, but Rav Yashav was so impressed by the deep sense of achrayas that Rav Meir had for Klal Yisrael. He was so impressed by the care and the love that Rav Meir had for every Jew that he decided to take out of his precious time and come be Menachem Rav Meir. If Rav Yashiv 
could take out of his time to go meet Rav Meir, all of us today on Tisha B'Av can take out of our time and meet Rav Meir, get to know who he was, where he came from, and what he accomplished. Hashem said about Avram Avinu, Avram Avinu loves me so much that I know that that love will translate itself into the teaching of Torah and mitzvahs to his children. When somebody is passionate and goes out and teaches Torah and brings people closer to Hashem, that is a reflection of how close that person is to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Later, when he wasn't well and he lost his memory, and he came to visit while he was losing his memory, he came with a shadow because he knew it was only a matter of time before he wouldn't remember. I think it was sort of like going around and saying goodbye to his friends that he was afraid he would not remember because he knew what the diagnosis was. And he came to this house and he had a look at me for a minute and he stayed with me for 20 years. And then he went, Sammy, and he gave me a big hug. He remembered me. But uh, that was almost towards the end, the last time he came to America before he really, really wasn't well. It was uh, terrible that he got sick so young. My wife and I definitely wanted to go by and visit him and we knew that he wasn't as well and we knew that he had a condition uh, that was already diagnosed and we went to visit him. I think the only thing he was disappointed with is that he, he couldn't be at the Kotel <laughs> and help other Jews. And uh, we have to carry on that legacy. I spent some time with him, uh, thanking him for everything that he had done, expressing what, who I was teaching and what we had accomplished. Uh, the adults who I had been Zoha to teach and the children who I'm Zoha to teach and how that really all gets back to him. He never stopped until he was stopped, until the, the Rebbeinu Shalom literally stopped him. It was a, just a tremendous deep, deep nachas that he felt seeing me here, living in Lakewood, from wife, from children, member of, from, member of a from community, contributing to the Jewish people in so many ways. He felt a deep, deep nachas, and it gave me pleasure to see how much pleasure this man who, who never wanted anything for himself um, was able to receive and to enjoy uh, from the fruits of his labor, which was the life that I was now living. At our chasna uh, in Yerushalayim, uh, since my wife had also been met at the wall by Mayor Schuster, we thought it would be very appropriate for him to be an aide on our kasuba, and uh, he, with a lot of simcha, uh, participated in our chasna. My wife Robin and I have eight children, of whom five are married. Uh, those five married children have resulted in, at this point, Bliya and her 13 grandchildren. The fact that we are where we are with uh, dedicated Jewish children and beautiful grandchildren and an opportunity to teach Torah and to spread Torah in such a meaningful way was really the dedication and the warmth and the mysterious nefesh of Rabbi Schuster. When I came back to Israel in 1996, my oldest son uh, was nine. I had a seven-year-old and a six-year-old. And when I would go to the Kotel and see Reb Mir, I would bring him, because Reb Mir would daven for the, daven for the Am, he would daven and lead the, lead the service, and I would bring them in front of him. And they would stand there and I would say, this is how he daven. I want you to see the guy who may be religious, the guy who you're here in Israel because of, and I want you to watch the way that he davens. Because um, again, it was this complete dedication. Each of us shouldn't underestimate the impact we have on another person by just caring and sharing something that you deeply believe in. There are ways in which people touch you to, uh, to help you come and become much greater than you thought you ever could become. And I think Rabbi Mayer was one of those people who helped me see that. And all of us 
need to realize that we have plenty of assets available to us to touch the lives of other Jews. And Rev. Mayer certainly is Machai of us because he taught us that you just have to care. And if you don't care enough, then that's something that we have to work on and that we can use him as an example. The schus that he has is a single person in a generation, Joachim Bedoro. When I just look at him, you stand in awe of a, of a man like this, what he could accomplish. Could you, and I always thought to myself, could you imagine? If you had such a passion, you also have other things going with it. I mean, how much could be accomplished? I mean, what are you going to tell the Rebbein Shalalim after 120 years? Where were you? Where was I? I mean, what, uh, you know, what we could have done. Meishus is just a, a, a he's somebody to, to really admire. And uh, he was just great. I mean, not that he was, he, he, he just, you saw there was nothing else. I was, I was a shy person. But, you know, sometimes you have to do something, you do it. That's all. Here is, is the most important thing in the world today. Because we're losing so many. It's the most important thing. So that it's imperative that you do cure. To, to, to reach out, to, to try to help somebody.